Hey folks, I thought I'd start just by running through the logistics of what's going to happen here before I introduce Jesse to give you the kind of health and safety requirements and stuff like that. So as you know, you're in the Alison Dixon Lecture Theatre here. And if you need the bathrooms or anything like that, they're back out at the top of the steps and just outside the building on the right hand side there. If there is an emergency, oxygen masks will not drop from the ceiling above us, so we don't need to worry about that. But we do need to head out in orderly fashion and meet out on the car park there. It has never happened before. Lecture Theatre does a good job of not burning down, so we, we should be fine. I'd also like to pay my respects and acknowledge the traditional owners here. I think it's a fabulous thing as somebody who's not originally from Australia to come and live and work on the continent with the world's oldest astronomers with a history and a heritage of astronomical research and knowledge and wisdom more than 60,000 years long. It's a fabulous thing to be able to participate in that. And I do like to pay my own personal respects, like I said, to the elders past, present and emerging from all across this wonderful continent, and particularly from the local people, the Jarawara and Gaibel people. And my apologies if I mispronounced that with my Yorkshire accent. We have a mix of people here, both in the room and people online in the webinar. And when we get to the end of the talk, if there are any questions, we can take as many questions as you want. You can come down and have a chat to Jesse or we can have formal questions. And we will try and take questions from the online audience as well as the in-person audience, try and spread the love around. I will probably grab one of the wonderful PhD students in the front here to be a microphone runner at that point, just to help take the microphone around so everybody online can hear the questions you ask for those in the room. I think that's about all we need in terms of logistics. I would like to introduce, it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Jesse Christiansen, who is a fabulous world-regarded researcher, one of the world-leading scientists in our wonderful field of exoplanetary science, searching for planets around other stars. She's also originally a local. She's one of us who has done wonderful things and moved to the US to really lead the global search for planets around other stars. So I'll say no more, I'll let Jessie say a few words about her background and introduce you. Please welcome Dr. Jessie Christensen. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jonti, and thank you, Toowoomba, for having me back. I was here five years ago, um, and I gave a talk, which I'm hoping is a little different from this talk, because uh, even in five years, the exoplanet field has really exploded. Um, as John T. mentioned, I am local-ish. Uh, I grew up in a small town called Peak Crossing, uh, which is about 20 minutes south of Ipswich, between Ipswich and Boona, on the Ipswich-Boona Road. Uh, you know, a small enough town that it didn't have its own road. We we're on someone else's road. Um, but one thing about growing up in a small country town in, in Queensland is the sky, right? The sky is beautiful. We're so blessed with the sky in the Southern Hemisphere and in a small town. Uh, so I fell in love with the sky and I decided I wanted to know everything about it. Turns out I really wanted to know about one particular thing. There are parts of the sky I don't care about. Uh, I'm married to a theorist who studies galaxies and our whole marital dynamic is me telling him how boring galaxies are. Uh, but exoplanets are very, very cool. <clears throat> so let's talk about exoplanets. And unfortunately, I'm gonna talk about why most of them will kill us. It's not, a, it's not a bummer the whole talk, I promise. <clears throat> All right, this is a schematic of our solar system. Not to scale, not to scale. This is our sun on the left. We've got one star. We have eight things that we call planets. Yes, I know, we used to have nine. The little kids in the audience will never know that there were nine planets once. <laughs> There's eight planets. Uh, we have the four rocky planets of the inner solar system and the four giants of the outer solar system. We also have dwarf planets. Dwarf planets are the new bucket that we invented when we started to find more things that looked like Pluto and realized that Pluto and these other things didn't actually look like the other things we called planets. So we came up with a new bucket called dwarf planets, and that's what Pluto ended up in. So still a planet, just a dwarf planet. We also have minor planets. This is everything else in our solar system that we've been able to find and label. And there are over 700 things. With the release of the most recent data from the Near Earth Orbiting Surveyor satellite, this is over a million now. I need to update this number since this last time I gave this talk. There are over a million things in the solar system that are just out there. Space is huge and empty, but also has a lot in it. 
So what are exoplanets? What am I talking about when I say that the coolest thing in astronomy right now is exoplanets? Exoplanets are planets around other stars, right? So our star is just one of hundreds of billions of stars in our galaxy. So when we go outside at night in a small town in Southeast Queensland and look at the star sky, it's full of stars. And for thousands of years, we've been wondering, do those stars have planets around them too? Like our sun, what would make our sun special? And it turns out that they do. And it turns out that most of them do. And it turns out that planets are everywhere. That's the punchline, you guys can go now. But if you wanna learn more about the planets, we can talk through more. So as I said, we've been thinking about this for a long time. In 6,000 BC, two and a half thousand years ago, the Greek philosophers were talking about the idea of other Earths, whether Earth was singular or plural. Now they were talking about it in a purely hypothetical way, kind of the way we talk about multiverses today, like a really cool idea that we have no way of testing, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't think about it. That's the way they were thinking about other Earths. And so Plato and Aristotle actually argued that there was only one Earth, that Earth was single, uh, that there would never be other Earths. This is two and a half thousand years ago. We're already thinking about other planets. Okay, let's fast forward to the Renaissance. The Renaissance was an incredible time in, in Western Europe for art and science and literature. Uh, and this is a quote from an Italian mathematician called Giordano Bruno. And he said, there are countless suns and countless earths all rotating around their suns in exactly the same way as the seven planets of our system. Now, the Renaissance was actually a bad time to say something like this. Uh, very inflammatory. Uh, the, the Catholic Church was in charge of Italy at this point, essentially, and this was an Italian mathematician. And this was very much against the Catholic teachings of the time. Uh, he was actually burned at the stake eight years after saying this, uh, in part for claiming the plurality of worlds, in part because he also said some stupid stuff about the church at a bad time to say, say stupid stuff about the church, but in part because he claimed that there were exoplanets. So thankfully in 2023, I'm not worried about getting executed for claiming there are exoplanets. Okay, let's fast forward again to the last century. So now we've had this idea out there for thousands of years that there are planets around other stars. Finally, we have this paper from 1952, Otto Struve, who's an astronomer. He's like, okay, how are we gonna find them? How are we gonna detect them? How are we gonna prove to ourselves that these planets exist? And so he knew that two stars orbiting each other, we could see that with our instruments at the time. You could see that two stars were orbiting each other just by looking at the velocities of the stars. And he was like, okay, what if we took one of those stars out and put a planet in instead? Would the velocities be big enough that we could still see it? And he was like, ah, we could if our instruments could get better. Like we can't do it with our current instruments, but if our instruments get better, we could do this. In particular, we could do it if there are gas giant planets like Jupiter right next to the star, like orbiting the star in just a few days. So this paper was basically dead and buried as soon as it came out because there were no such thing as gas giants orbiting their star in just a few days. That didn't make any sense. We knew how planetary systems formed. They had rocky planets close to the star and giant planets far away. What kind of crazy system would have a giant planet right next to the star? Even if this technique worked, that system wouldn't exist. So what was the point? So for the next 40 years, if you look, this paper has seven citations because no one thought this would happen. In 1995, the first planet was found orbiting a star like the sun using the method that Otto Struve suggested. And it's the planet that Otto Struve suggested. It's a gas giant that orbits its star in just a few days. Since 1995, this paper has over a hundred citations all of the, oh, hey, this, this was actually right. These exist. Wow. Uh, and this planet, 51 Peg, was a, uh, the discovery of this was awarded the Nobel Prize in 2019. So 70 years after Otto Struve was like, hey, what if gas giant planets orbited really close to their star? The Nobel Prize was awarded for the discovery of just such a planet. So in thousands of years, we went from just the idea to the idea of how it could be done to the actual discovery of the first planet around a star like the sun. So where are we at now? Since, since the early 90s, the number of planets has been increasing exponentially. And now since the pandemic, 
you guys all know what exponential curves are. You saw them a lot in the news. It was a very useful science communication tool for me. The number of planets has been increasing faster and faster and faster with time over the last few decades. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so this is, a, this is a tweet. Now, unfortunately, Twitter is dying a slow death, but I used to tweet a lot. Uh, this is a tweet where I'm saying, I'm asking the question, is there a Moore's law for exoplanets? Moore's law is this famous uh, software law, which essentially says the speed of processes doubles every two years. And I was looking at this curve and I was saying, is there a Moore's law for exoplanets? Is there a time over which it doubles uh, because it's exponential? And this is a response uh, from Eric Mamajak, who's the dep deputy chief scientist of NASA's exoplanet exploration program. And he much more cleverly than me uh, put it as a log plot instead of a linear plot where you can actually see it is exponential. And he says, yes, it is exponential. The doubling time is 27 months, so just over two years. And his prediction was that we would hit a million planets in 2034 and a billion planets by 2057. This is a billion planets we know outside our solar system. This is where the title of the talk comes from, on the road to a billion planets. So I like to call this Mama Jack's law, and I'm really trying to make it stick. So anytime you get a chance to just work it into your everyday conversation, just throw a Mama Jack's law in there. Let's see if we can, let's see if we can make it happen. So since we've had one, now we have thousands. <clears throat> this is a video showing the discovery in the place on the sky of where the planets were found of planets over the last 30 years. And it has sound, so I'm gonna shush. The frequency of the sound, how high the pitch is, is related to how far away the planet is from the star. So very close planets are very high pitched and very far away planets are very low pitched. And they're colored by the way they were discovered. So let's start this. So this was a video that NASA commissioned for a major milestone that we hit last year, which is 5,000 known planets outside our solar system. So my role for NASA is that I'm the project scientist for NASA's exoplanet archive. This is how NASA keeps track of all of the planets that we found and everything we know about them, where we are, how big they are, how hot they are, what kind of star they're orbiting, what kind of system they're in. Uh, and so we had this made, this beautiful sonification by the folks at System Sounds for this milestone of reaching 5,000 planets. And now we're at, we're already at over 5,300 just since then. Okay, so that's a lot of planets. What do we actually know about them? What are we finding? Do they look like our solar system? Do they look like Earth? Do they look like us? So before 2010, this is a plot showing what we knew about planets so far. So on the x-axis, on this axis here, what I'm showing is the period of the planet, how long it takes the planet to go around the star. So for the Earth, that's 365 days. That's how long one year is, 365 days. On the y-axis, I'm showing the size of the planet relative to the size of Earth. So this is one Earth radii here. Jupiter's up here at about 11 Earth radii, and Neptune is here at four. So put another way, this axis is basically these planets are further away on this side and these planets are bigger. <clears throat> these purple squares here, those are the inner solar system planets. So this is Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. So Earth is out here at one Earth radii in 365 days. So 
What I mostly want you to take away from this is the planets that we discovered before 2010 were almost all these planets that Otto Struve projected, gas giants that orbited their star in just a few days. And we call those hot Jupiters because they're heated to thousands of degrees and astronomers aren't very imaginative and shouldn't be allowed to name things. Uh, so these are all called hot Jupiters. And mostly what we were finding were hot Jupiters because they're the easiest things to find. This is what it looks like as of the end of last year. And you can see we've really filled in the space between the hot Jupiters and the planets of our solar system with this huge glut of planets in here. <clears throat> this is mostly due to something called the Kepler mission. And that's the mission that I've worked on for the last decade. Uh, it was a one meter telescope. So a one meter telescope, this, this whole thing here is like the size of like a small school van um, that we launched into space in 2009. Uh, its goal was, it had a very specific question that it was trying to answer, how common are planets like the earth? So rocky planets that are the right distance from their star so that the water is liquid on the surface. That's kind of what makes Earth special, right? Like Venus is too hot, Mars is too cold. That's why we call it the Goldilocks zone. Earth is just right for liquid water on the surface. So the goal of Kepler was to answer this question, how common are planets like the Earth? Um, it stared at one patch of sky uh, in, for any amateur astronomers in the audience. It was this one patch of sky, a 10 by 10 degree field of view between the constellations of Cygnus and Lyra. And it looked at 200,000 stars for four years. How did it work? Uh, this is an animation which is showing the transit method. I'm going to show the transit method. Oh, it's going to take a second to catch up to me. There's a few different ways that we use to find planets. Let's see if we can get it to go. Uh, there's a few different ways that we can find planets. One of them is called the transit method. And this is just not going to work now. All right, I'm just gonna explain the transit method. Okay, so normally when we look at all the stars on the sky, they're not, the planetary systems around those stars are not lined up just right, but some of them are. So if you look at, the, if you look at one of the lights overhead, let's choose a spotlight, say that's the star. And if you put up your fist and put the fist in front of the star and pretend your fist is a planet, you're blocking the light, right? So if you're a telescope observing that star over and over again, you make a transit happen for me, Des? Yes. Make all the lights dim? Oh, sure. I thought he was just making a transit happen. I was like, that's great. This is so interactive. Um, so what we do is we look at hundreds of thousands of stars and just measure their brightness over and over and over again. And we wait for those stars to dim just a bit. And that's evidence that a planet's going in front. So if you were an alien civilization looking at our sun and you were lined up just right, Every 365 days, you'd see a little dip because the earth would pass in front of the sun. It would eclipse the sun and block some of the light. And this is what we do to find planets around other stars. And this is what Kepler did and found thousands of planets orbiting other stars. Uh, now, these are a lot of planets that were found by Kepler. And I said that the point of the mission was to find how common Earth-like planets were. So my question for the audience, did Kepler discover any Earth-like planets? No. Uh, you can see that we managed to fill in a lot of the space between the big planets and the small planets and the close-in planets and the far away planets, but actually we did not find any planets like the Earth. So straight away, hopefully some amongst you are like, oh wow, does that mean Earth-like planets are really rare because we didn't find any? Which would be an obvious assumption to draw. But it actually turns out that basically everything below this diagonal line is just too hard for Kepler to see. So we never actually reached the sensitivity we needed to find planets like the Earth. So it's still an open question of how common planets like the Earth are. We can extrapolate from, from shorter periods and bigger planets. We can say, okay, smaller planets look like this, uh, shorter periods look like this and bigger planets look like this. So we can make a guess and that's what we do. It's always dangerous because you're not quite sure if anything new and interesting happens between here and here. Our guesses, are that something between 10 to 50% of stars like the sun have an Earth-like planet. That's up to half. There are something like 10 billion stars like the sun in our galaxy. That's billions of Earth-like planets. 
that's a lot of Earth-like real estate in our galaxy and something we would never have been able to say 30 years ago or 500 years ago or two and a half thousand years ago. Now we know the answer to what Plato and Aristotle were talking about. There are billions of Earth-like planets in the galaxy. We're not exactly sure of how many billions, that's part of the uncertainty right now, but we know that they're not rare. That's pretty exciting. So what did we find? Uh, this is an animation of a planet called Kepler-452b. So Kepler-452b is the most Earth-like planet that Kepler found. Uh, it's about 50% bigger than the Earth. Uh, so that's a little worrying because when you get too much bigger than the Earth, you start to accrete a thicker and thicker atmosphere, uh, and then you end up a giant planet. So something like something like this, which we call a super Earth, might actually not be habitable. Uh, it might have too thick an atmosphere with too high a pressure at the bottom. So that's a little worrying, but you know, it might be rocky with a thin atmosphere, we don't know. The main problem with Kepler-452b is that it might not be there. Uh, the signal we see that looks like Kepler-452b also looks like a lot of noise. There's a, there's a feature in the data, I'm going to call it a feature very generously, there's a feature in the Kepler data uh, that mimics planetary signals at these periods. So it could be real, and if it's real, it could be the most Earth-like planet that we found, but it might not be there. So that's a bummer. Okay, but I don't want to be completely depressing. Let's talk about other things that have been found. This is a graphic of a planet called Proxima Centauri b. So hopefully everybody here knows Alpha Centauri, uh, one of the brightest stars in the sky. Uh, it's actually a triple star system. So there's Alpha Centauri A and B, which are two bright stars. And they're accompanied by a much smaller, cooler red star, which is actually quite far away on the sky, but gravitationally bound to those other two stars called Proxima Centauri. It's called Proxima Centauri because it's the closest star to us. If you leave our star system and start moving out, this is the first star you hit, Proxima Centauri. It's just under four light years away. So still a long way away, but it's the closest star to us. And one thing we found is a rocky planet in the habitable zone or the Goldilocks zone, which I described before, of this star. And it turns out that we've actually found a number of rocky planets in the habitable zones of these small, cool stars called M dwarfs. We found at least 12 so far. So that's exciting and also anxiety inducing. So it's exciting that there's all this rocky, all these rocky planets that are right temperature for water. That's great. What we don't know about these rocky planets orbiting M dwarfs is whether or not they're actually able to retain their atmospheres. So M dwarfs, these small, cool stars, small and cool makes them sound, you know, non-threatening. But actually, they put out a lot more of their energy as high energy radiation, like UV and X-rays, than our sun does. And UV and X-rays are, you know, classically bad for life, right? That's why the dentist gives you a lead apron. And that's why we invented SPF sunscreen, right? Because UV is bad and X-rays are bad. So these planets, all of these rocky planets in the habitable zones of these stars could just be completely sterilized. They could have no atmospheres and they could be completely sterilized by all of this UV and X-ray radiation. So we found 12, but we actually don't know if any of them are habitable. They're in the habitable zone, but they might not have atmospheres, they might not have water. So, so far, we truly haven't found anything that we could look at and say, this is Earth-like. <clears throat> this is a movie of James Webb. Ah, this one's actually gonna work. All right. uh, this is a movie uh, of a um, new telescope that NASA launched just over a year ago. Uh, called uh, JWST. Um, it's a six and a half meter infrared telescope. This is an animation of it unfolding in space, which is genuinely the most terrifying thing that most astronomers have had to deal with in our entire careers, that $10 billion worth of NASA budget had to go into space, like crumpled up like origami and then unfold in a very perfect sequence over several weeks to turn into the most incredible telescope that we've ever had access to. So JWST is going to do a lot of super cool stuff. Um, you might have seen headlines like the earliest galaxies and the largest galaxies. It's going to do a lot of interesting stuff for galaxy folks. For exoplanets folks, this is our chance to look at the atmospheres of these planets. This is our chance to actually peer into the atmospheres and find out what are the molecules, what are the atoms, what is the structure 
What are the biosignatures? And in particular, these small planets around M dwarfs, so far we don't know whether or not they have atmospheres. JWST will give us the answer. JWST is going to look at almost all of these rocky planets around M dwarfs in its first year. And it will finally be able to start telling us how many of them have atmospheres, how many of them might be habitable. Because if rocky planets around M dwarfs are habitable, there's 10 times as many M dwarfs in the galaxy as there are sun like stars. So that one to five billion number I said before could be 50 billion habitable planets in the galaxy. That's an incredible number. It's just so, so much possibility. So part of the reason we're really excited about JWST is learning the answer to this question. Are these planets habitable? Okay. So I feel like I just did a lot of saying we didn't find things. But we obviously found thousands of things. So what did we actually find? So we found a lot of hot Jupiters. So we've talked about those. These are the gas giants that orbit very close to their stars. You know, I practiced all the movies with sound and I didn't practice any of these other movies. Uh, so these are hot Jupiters. So they're gas giants really close to their stars. And they're so close that the stellar radiation is actually, you know, blowing away the upper atmospheres of these planets. You can actually see it. They have these huge uh, atmospheres around them of material that's being blown away. They're really quite <laughs> dramatic. Uh, one of them, HD 189733b, I'm going to pause there for a second and just apologize on behalf of astronomers. Exoplanets all have rubbish names. I'm really sorry. I, I don't actually get to change the rules about that. Um, but HD 189733b, uh, we, it's one of the hot Jupiters that we've been able to study in the most detail. And so, for instance, we've been able to discover the wind speed in the upper atmosphere, the temperature of the upper atmosphere, and the molecular composition of the upper atmosphere. And when we put all of those three pieces of information together, HD 189733b is so hot that it's raining liquid glass sideways constantly. That's how hot it is. It melts glass and just rains it sideways at two kilometers a second. It's not a, not a, not a fun place to be. It's dramatic. Okay, speaking of hot, we have found Earth-sized planets. You can see a bunch of planets down here at about around one Earth radii. And in particular, there's a set of planets that orbit their star in less than a day. This is one day. So these are all planets that orbit their star in less than, they go around their star in just a few hours. So these are planets that are heated up to thousands of degrees. And what happens to rock when you heat it up to thousands of degrees? It melts. So we think these planets have massive lava oceans facing their stars, just lakes of lava. Um, and we call them lava worlds because again, we shouldn't be allowed to name things. Um, but these are some of the most exciting targets for JWST as well. What's happening on these lava worlds? Do they have atmospheres? What can we see? Um, so these are really, really exciting worlds to study. Okay, we did find lots of rocky planets. They're pretty exciting. We did find lots of Jupiter, uh, of Uranus and Neptune sized planets that are just closer to their stars than our Uranus and Neptune. Uh, but I wanna draw your attention to this huge density of planets in between our rocky planets and our ice giants, Uranus and Neptune. So this is, this is Uranus and Neptune up here at four, and then Earth is down here at one. And most of the planets that we found, and so far as far as, as far as we can tell, the most common kind of planet is a planet in between the size of Earth and Neptune. Now, why is that interesting? So in our solar system, here are the sizes of the giant planets relative to each other. So you have Jupiter, Saturn, and Uranus and Neptune are about the same size at four. Then you have a big jump down to Earth and Venus and Mars and Mercury. So you have this big gap here. And these, this population of planets that we found that we call super Earths, uh, are bigger than Earth, <laughs> smaller than Neptune, um, uh, are in between this size. So in our solar system, we don't have something in this size bracket, even though it seems like it's the most common kind of planet out there. When we look at hundreds of thousands of other stars, we see super Earths everywhere, but we don't see them in our solar system. We see our small rocky planets and we see our ice giants. And that's really interesting. Why don't we have the most common kind of planet in the galaxy? Now, you might have heard of Planet Nine. So Planet Nine is an idea that was put forth by some Caltech astronomers a few years ago um, that there might be an additional planet out past the orbit of Neptune 
not Pluto, which was the original Planet Nine and is now not Planet Nine, out by out past the orbit of Neptune in the Kuiper Belt. And what the reason they think that is, if you look at the orbits of the Kuiper Belt objects, there seems like there's a clustering of objects that isn't random in a way that you'd expect. And one thing to explain that clustering of objects is if there's a planet that's kind of gravitationally interacting with them and forcing them to cluster. Um, and that planet, if it exists, would be a super Earth. If you think about the mass that's needed to do this clustering, it would be a super Earth sized planet. Uh, so perhaps we do have a super Earth, perhaps we do have the most common kind of planet in our galaxy. Um, but that, that question is still out. We're still working that one out. Uh, what other kinds of planetary systems have we found? Uh, you might recognize this is a still from the original Star Wars movie um, with uh, Luke Skywalker on Tatooine watching this famous double sunset. So this movie is from the 70s. This predates any discovery of exoplanets. Uh, there's a really fun thing you can do where you look at all of the planets that have come up in science fiction and work out which, of, which ones of them uh, have real world correspondence. Uh, so Tatooine is a planet orbiting two stars. Uh, and we have found that. We have found planetary systems where you have one or more planets orbiting a double star system. Um, this is one that I like because uh, if you look, George Lucas, predating the discovery of exoplanets by decades, even got the colors right of the stars. It's a yellow star and a red star. Not the sizes, but again, admittedly, two decades before we even found them. But he even got the colors right, a binary system with a yellow star and a red star. So now we have about a dozen of these systems of one or more planets orbiting multiple stars. Okay, <clears throat> we've also found planets orbiting white dwarfs. So you might have heard that in five billion years, our sun will expand and become a red giant and perhaps expand even out to where Earth is. And there's long been speculation about what the fate of Earth will be at that point. Like we think Mercury gets disintegrated. We think Venus gets disintegrated. But what happens to Earth and the planets out past Earth? After the sun goes through its red giant phase, eventually it like sloughs off those outer layers to become one of the beautiful planetary nebulae that you might have seen. And what's left in the middle is just like this cooling chunk of carbon and oxygen that just like slowly radiates heat forever and cools down called a white dwarf. That's like the final phase of our sun. Our sun's not interesting enough to get big enough to go supernova or anything. It's just gonna become this cooling chunk of carbon and oxygen. But we have found now planets orbiting these white dwarfs. We, we see white dwarfs around us, these dying stages of stars, and now we've seen planets orbiting them. So we know that it's possible for either planets to survive this whole rad, red giant expansion and then you know white dwarf creation, or a second generation of planets to form. Perhaps the original planetary system gets disintegrated or disrupted by this whole expansion contraction process and a second generation of planets is born out of the remnants of that. But we have found planets around white dwarfs. So that's really interesting for us, thinking about the fate of our sun five billion years from now, what's gonna happen to the earth? We might survive. We might be able to actually hang out and survive around a white dwarf. Okay, we've also found very, very crowded systems. Uh, so this is a system that I showed before. Um, this is seven rocky planets orbiting a small, cool red star called TRAPPIST-1. Uh, three or perhaps four, depending on your definition, of these planets are in the habitable zone of this star. They might have liquid water on the surface. The impressive thing about this system, these seven planets, they all orbit closer to their star than Mercury does. So this star manages to fit a seven planet system inside where Mercury is in our solar system. So super close. And the way it's able to do this is by having these planets all locked in resonances. So they're all, the periods of their orbits are all related to each other. And we actually see that in our solar system. So the Galilean moons of Jupiter, Jupiter has these four lovely big moons that Galileo first saw with his telescope when he turned it to the sky. Three of them are in resonance with each other, a one to two to four resonance. So for every uh, four times the interior planet goes around, the next one goes around twice, and then the one after that round goes around once. And so they're all related to each other. And that means they hold each other, they lock each other into this resonance once they're in it. And so the seven planets of TRAPPIST-1 are in this chain of resonances. Um, and so this video, I think, does work because I tried it, because <laughs> it has sound. Um, so this is a video showing a system called K2-138. So K2-138, was actually discovered by Australian citizen scientists in 2017 
Um, the BBC has this show called Stargazing Live, and they, they travelled out to Australia for a st BBC Stargazing Live Australia. And as part of the show, they featured a citizen science project called Exoplanet Explorers uh, that I and my colleague Ian Crossfield had started. So, of course, if you have a citizen science project, the thing you want is people to know about your project. So uh, in 48 hours, the project had completely exploded and the citizen scientists had found K2138. K2138 is a system of six planets. Uh, the inner five are in a series of resonances and they're in a series of three to two resonances. Okay. All right, so you should hear music. Now, in this sonification, also done by the System Sounds folks, the periods of the planets have been turned into music. So the highest pitch you hear is the period of the fastest planet in the middle, all the way out to the lowest pitch of the planet. And the reason it sounds pretty, the reason it sounds like a song and not just like someone mashing on a piano, it's because of the resonances. They're all in a sequence of three to two resonances. So for every three times the inner planet goes around, the next one goes around twice. For every three times that one goes around, the next one goes around twice. For every three times that one goes around, the next one goes around twice, and so on. It's this pristine chain of three to two resonances. And it was discovered by citizen scientists here in Australia. Um, one of them uh, was a mechanic from Darwin, uh, and when they interviewed him for the news uh, the next day, when the whole thing got announced, he was like, yeah, it's my first scientific publication. And I just loved the confidence with which that statement indicated there would clearly be more. Like, it's my first, there will be more. Uh, and so citizen science is like this incredible opportunity for people at home on their computers to discover planets. Uh, there is an ongoing citizen science project called planethunters.org, so if you're interested, in discovering your own planet and getting on a scientific paper, uh, please head there and help us find exoplanets. I've talked a lot about planets that we've discovered already. Now I'm gonna talk about planets that we're discovering now and into the future. So Kepler, the mission that I mentioned before, ran out of fuel in 2018. It wasn't actually able to keep doing its observations. But in 2018, NASA launched the TESS mission. Uh, so where Kepler was that like single one meter telescope pointing at one patch of sky, TESS is four 10 centimeter telescopes. Like some of you have bigger lenses on your cameras at home. Four 10 centimeter telescopes uh, doing an all sky survey. So it's looking at, at every part of the sky, looking at all of the bright stars and trying to find all of the planets that are closest to us. And the predictions are that it'll find more than 10,000 planets. So I mentioned that we have about 5,300 so far. This will, you know, triple the amount of planets that we have. <clears throat> Another mission that's coming up is called the Nancy Grace Roman mission uh, that NASA is launching. So this is a similar plot to what you showed before, so don't be afraid. Um, this is the hot Jupiters. This is that big glut of super Earths and Neptunes, sub-Neptunes that we talked about. Um, this, all of these red points and these red lines kind of show the limits of Kepler. This is what Kepler discovered, and this is basically where Kepler was sensitive to, the point being that we barely got to Earth, not quite really. Now, Roman is a two and a half meter telescope um, that is gonna launch in something like 2027, um, and it's gonna use a different technique called microlensing to discover planets. And what's particularly cool about microlensing is that it's sensitive to further away planets than Kepler was. So we're actually able to push out past the orbits of, for instance, Earth, uh, and out to the giant planets. So Roman will be able to complete the census that Kepler started. So where Kepler has given us this really exquisite look at the inner regions of solar systems, Roman will tell us about the outer regions of solar systems. And we'll really start to be able to ask questions like, is our solar system normal? You know, we haven't really been able to answer that question yet because we haven't been sensitive to large uh, areas of solar systems. We've really only gotten the inner parts. And it would be really good to know. One of the reasons it would be really good to know if our solar system is normal is the question of Jupiter. There's a paper that I like. It's Jupiter, friend or foe? Life on Earth might be helped by Jupiter or hurt by Jupiter. So Jupiter is, you know, the big honcho in the whole solar system besides the sun. And in the early part of the solar system, when the planets are forming and there's a lot going on, it's doing a lot of work redirecting asteroids and comets to Earth and smashing things into the Earth, which might sound bad, but actually that's how we got most of our water, 
right? Like a lot of the water on Earth is delivered by asteroids and comets in the early solar system. Um, now I'm, I'm getting off track because I want to tell you that this is still like open debate, but it's okay. That people are still arguing about how and when Earth got its water. But Jupiter likely smashed a bunch of things into Earth that had water on them. We know that's true. But at some point, Jupiter smashing things into the Earth stops being helpful and starts being hurtful, right? Like 65 million years ago, an asteroid comes and smashes into the Earth and it, you know, wipes out 99 point something percent of life, right? That's bad. Uh, we recover eventually, obviously, because we're here tonight. Um, but Jupiter might have helped us and might have hurt us. So the question when we look at other solar systems is, do you need a Jupiter to deliver water? Are too many Jupiters a bad thing? Can Jupiter get too big? There's all these questions right now. The point of which would be, it would be great to know what other solar systems look like. And we'll finally be able to get that answer with Roman. Uh, Roman is also expected to find uh, 100,000 planets, uh, some with microlensing and some with the transit method that I already mentioned. Okay, just imagine that you don't have the plot in the foreground. This is the, this is the video they made of, of Roman. It's like this opening scene of Star Wars with the, star, with the destroyer coming on. It's literally the destroyer coming on scene, on scene except it's a telescope from NASA. Uh, and I just like how, how Star Wars-y they directly made it. You can practically hear, you know, the Star Wars theme in the background. Um, but anyway, so Roman's going to launch in about 2027. <clears throat> okay. Now, what I'm excited about with Roman is everything I've told you so far will kill you, mostly painfully, right? They're all too hot or too big or too cold or have no atmosphere or, you know, have a really high surface gravity that would crush you. Um, there's a lot of ways that the planets that I've shown you so far will kill you. Hopefully, Roman will find some planets that finally won't necessarily kill us, which is pretty exciting. Okay, we're good. So now we're kind of at this unique point in history. We had this idea thousands of years ago that planets might exist. And we worked for thousands of years to turn that idea into reality. We built the technology. We found the planets. We know they exist. This is an, a movie of a planetary system called HR 8799. So the sun is in the middle being blocked out by the very exquisite instrumentation. And these four blobs that you can kind of see orbiting are the four planets that we know about so far, hint, hint, in this system. Um, uh, JWST might show us something cool. Um, so there's four planets orbiting this star. Uh, and this is, this is as good as this technology basically is to be able to actually take an image of a planet. These four planets are all super Jupiters. They're all young, hot super Jupiters. They're big planets putting out a lot of heat, which is why we can see them. Now, we know that there are small planets out there. We think that there are Earth-like planets out there. So now we're kind of back at this point where we're like, okay, now we have to go back to the drawing board. How do we get from now where we know that the planets exist and we just need to do something different to find them? So we're kind of in the inverse of where we were before. So I want to introduce something called the Habitable Worlds Observatory, which is a big, big, big fancy name uh, because we're going to ask for big, big, big fancy dollars to pay for it. Uh, so this is like the history of NASA's exoplanet missions. Yeah, I'm going to call Hubble an exoplanet mission and I'm going to call JWST an exoplanet mission. Uh, but you can see uh, Hubble, you can see Kepler, which we talked about. You can see TESS, which we talked about. You can see JWST, which we talked about. We, you can see Roman. The next thing, this is the thing that's going to launch 20 to 30 years from now. It's called the Habitable Worlds Observatory. Now, the idea of Habitable Worlds Observatory is to be able to make this movie, make this image for a solar system uh, that has an Earth-like planet in it. And so this is a simulation of what our solar system would look like from, you know, 30 light years away. Uh, and you would be able to, the point of this instrument would that you'd be able to see the Earth and see Venus and see Jupiter. You'd actually be able to take a picture of an Earth-like planet. You'd be able to take the light from that dot and spread it out and look for the fingerprints of molecules like water and phosphine and carbon dioxide and methane, ozone, all of these interesting things. So that's where we're at. We're at this point where we know where we want to go now. 
We know what we need to build. We just have to do it. We just have to get there. Uh, and that takes time and money, um, neither of which there's a lot of in science generally. Uh, but you know, I'm really excited to be part of a bunch of groups now that are working on how to make this happen. How do we make NASA fun? How do worlds observatory? How do we take a picture of an Earth-like planet? How do we really go out there and find life? Uh, so thank you. That's my talk. Fabulous. Thank you. I'll let you have your drink and we'll get the lights up. Yeah, okay. And we'll try and take questions from within the room and questions from on Zoom if there are any. So if we can get a volunteer from one of the students to come run around with microphones, that'd be really appreciated. Who's wearing comfy shoes? Comfy shoes. There we go. Well, thanks for your talk. Um, looking at the occlusion method and the noise that you mentioned about Kepler, if you're working an occlusion method, then all the other objects in the planetary plane are going past your detector. So that may be telling you something interesting about the Kuiper belt and all the other rubbish that's in those other systems that hasn't been analyzed yet. Yeah, so there are a few, do I need to repeat for the Zoom people or can they hear it? No. Okay, yeah. Um, so there have been a few things like exocomets that have been found uh, and there are sorts of rings of dusty material that have been found. Um, there's a star called Tabby's star where we see that the star gets occluded by something like huge and kind of irregular, irregularly shaped, which we think is like a cloud of, of asteroids or dust or something, you know, that's orbiting the star. Um, if stuff is big enough, we can see it. Uh, most of the, like most of the Kuiper Belt objects, for instance, you, you wouldn't see individually. Um, have you looked at the spoke structures and raised structures in the rings of Saturn? Um, as a possible, as a possible scale up mechanism to, to give you those exoplanet. Yeah, noise. so there's only two examples so far of ringed systems. One of them is pretty solid. The other one, we're not sure. Um, and we see multiple rings, but I don't think we have enough signal to noise to see features in the rings yet. <clears throat> Thank you. Boris. Uh, this is um, Xiao Hui Tao from uh, School of Mathematics, Physics and Computing. And um, coming from uh, the artificial intelligence background, firstly, it's, uh, thank you very much for the presentation. It's very interesting. I uh, really enjoyed it, even though I'm not coming from an uh, astrophysics background. It's uh, really easy to uh, catch up and uh, really enjoy that. Um, since I'm coming from an uh, AI background, uh, my question is more like this. And so do you or NASA um, has the confidence on AI may cutting into this uh, new development and plates and some roles in that. If there is uh, some sort of confidence on that, do you think at what extent AI may do in say assist you people in this discovery, please? Sure, we actually have grad students right here who are using machine learning to, to work on how to help us get through the data. We have really moved into the era of big data in exoplanets. So TESS, which I mentioned, because it's doing this all sky survey, it's taking an image, which is basically 90 degrees of the sky times about that wide, you know, every two minutes at this point, 180 seconds. Uh, and then it, and, you know, does that for, it, it stares at that field and takes an image every two minutes for a month. And then it moves and does the next one, does the next one. So we've just got piles of data. Uh, and that's where, you know, things like AI and machine learning really start to be able to help you, right? So we used to do it with citizen science. Now we're hoping to do it with AI. So yes, people are really thinking about it. Um, and some, you know, some AI applications have already found exoplanets in data. So some of the Kepler planets were found with machine learning algorithms. Looking forward to it. Thanks. Good evening. Hi. Thank you for your talk. Um, my name's Steve. I'm actually a student of Jonty's. I have a question. If we're looking at when we're looking at things like uh, the Trappist system or Proxima Centauri, they're tidally locked mostly, aren't they? Is it possible? I know there's a high amount of radiation, but is it possible that there could be some sort of biological life on the Terminator line or? That. Yeah, there was a recent paper looking at Terminator lines. I actually don't think we even need to go to the Terminator. If the surface of the, if the subsurface stellar point of the planet that's facing the star is cool enough, then you could just live there. I always wonder, you know, we think tidally locked, that's crazy. So tidally locked means one side of the planet is always daytime and the other side of the planet is always nighttime. And we're like, that's wild. Like, 
But I always imagine what if life lives on one of those planets and they're looking at the earth and they're like, oh my God, like every 24 hours you go from being in sunlight to moonlight to sunlight to no light. Like, what are you doing? Like, I always imagine life on tidally locked planets thinks we're weird. Uh, I think, you know, I don't think life has a problem on tidally locked planets. Like if you're on a planet that's too hot on the day side and too cold on the night side, that's when the Terminator is interesting, right? Like, is there a region on this planet that's habitable? And, you know, there are parts of Earth technically that aren't habitable, right? Like I went to the South Pole for two weeks as a grad student. I wouldn't want to live there. <laughs> uh, so people are thinking about the Terminator, but you don't have to restrict yourself to the Terminator for tidally locked planets. It just depends on the temperature. Thank you. Uh, another question just following on from what you were just saying, when we were looking at the Cassini Huygens and they uh, crashed the, which one was it? They crashed into Titan and we saw there was lakes of well, nasty Thane, stuff. Liquid yes. we, we, we see uh, extremophiles in a, in, on our planet. What are the odds that there may be biological life in some of these places like Titan? Yeah. So people are thinking about, you know, a lot of what I talked about already was about looking for liquid water. And we look for liquid water because that's the solvent that life happens in on Earth. But it's just a solvent. And life is just a series of energy gradients. So it's possible to come up with alternative chemistries that use different solvents and just have different energy gradients. So that's an active area of research right now is, are there other types of chemistry that could work in different environments? So partly why we focus on water, liquid water, um, is because we're usually asking for a lot of money uh, and we need to give a really good reason why NASA should give us $600 million to fly Kepler. Uh, and it's because the one place we know that has life, the reason for that life is liquid water. So we go hunting for liquid water. But when a lot of people are thinking about what are the other kinds of liquid solvents that you could have life in. So there's another mission that's going to Titan uh, soon, um, Dragonfly. It's going to have like a quadcopter that's going to fly around the lakes of Titan and like sample things. That's so cool. We're going to send a helicopter to a moon. Thank you, Jesse. Well, if everybody's feeling shy, um, we can bring the formal proceedings to close and then the shy people can come down and ask their questions in private. How about that? So let's all say, oh, we do have... A question up there from Alison Nickel, who says, what is stopping us from finding Planet Nine? Ah, what's stopping us from finding Planet Nine is that if it exists, it's very faint, very, very faint. Um, and there's a lot of sky to search for it in. Um, so the scientists who found this overdensity of Kuiper Belt objects made a prediction for like where in the sky to look, but it's still a lot of real estate. Now, the most likely real estate has been looked at and nothing was found. Um, so a lot of scientists are like, okay, so maybe this is not super credible. But the scientists who proposed it have like, well, like that's just the most likely part. Let's look at some of the less likely parts. So the search is ongoing. It's just very faint and very hard to find. Um, so they're using a lot of like delicate, dedicated telescope time to scan the sky. Um, <clears throat> there are big online sky surveys like the Vera Rubin Observatory has a, has a survey that's going to come online. It's expected to find a lot of these like faint, slow moving objects. So maybe, um, but people aren't super hopeful. What's stopping us is that it's faint. We've got a long history and heritage of planet X's that turned out not to be real yeah. with signals like this because doing this science is hard. Yes. One of the things we've learned is not to name your planet Vulcan because then it's not going to be real. That's happened multiple times now. No Vulcans. Most recently, like last week, wasn't it? Most recently, like two weeks ago. <laughs> <laughs> there was a planet that uh, was orbiting 40 Eridani A, which in the Star Trek universe is the star that Vulcan Spock's homeworld is orbiting. Uh, so we were really excited when it got announced like five or six years ago. Uh, and then it just recently got refuted, where they discovered that the signal that they thought was a planet was actually the star's activity, the star's rotation period was just mimicking a planetary signal, which happens. We've got, I'm not so much sure if this is a question or an essay from Greg. <laughs> um, Greg says, Jesse, great talk, thank you. Given the data that you've studied so far, has your belief that ET exists increased exponentially? Sure, sure, sure. Well, I can start with that one. I'm really excited that over my career, we've gone from not knowing whether rocky planets existed to knowing they're common. Like that's already super exciting. There's something called the Drake equation. So Frank Drake, a uh, famous SETI astronomer, um, uh, just passed away last year, uh, came up with something called the Drake equation, which is seven numbers. And, and he 
they're not really an equation, it's more a set of numbers that you would need to know to get an estimate of how many intelligent civilizations there were in the galaxy. Uh, one of those numbers is the frequency of Earth-like planets, right? Like if Earth-like planets are super rare, then your whole probability of having many intelligent civilizations goes down. If your probability of having Earth-like planets is very high, then the whole number goes up. The whole thing is actually like a series of probabilities. So any one of them could be between zero and one. So they all have a lot of power over the final number. But now we know that the frequency of Earth-like planets is not massively high or massively low. We think it's you know between 10 to 50%. Um, so for me, that's really exciting. Now, in terms of how it's affected my belief in ET, so we only have one example of a place where life arose. And when we look back at the geological record, simple single-celled life arose immediately on Earth. Like as soon as Earth was cool enough to have liquid water on the surface, like within 100 million years, which in astronomical times is nothing, you see evidence of single simple-celled life. And that lasts for billions of years before you see an explosion of multi-celled complex life that becomes everything we see today. So it's very, very difficult to draw inferences from a sample size of one, but it could be that making simple life is e easy and happens very easily on any planet that has water, but making complicated life is hard. It takes billions of years. It takes some confluence of, you know, these particular single-celled things. We're changing our atmosphere to be an oxygen-rich atmosphere. And then when we became multi-celled, we could take advantage of that oxygen-rich atmosphere to breathe oxygen, right? Like, who knows what the sequence of events is to make complicated life? But the sequence of events for making simple single-celled life seems to be have liquid water. So it's really hard to draw conclusions. I think that there is probably simple single-celled life many, many places in the galaxy. The fact that we haven't seen any evidence of complex life besides us makes me think that that's probably rare. But it's all just the inferences I can draw from a very, very small amount of data. Is there more to the question that I should? Um, just, just make an observation or ask the question, that if, um, uh, because they're so far away then, uh, that it would be difficult for them to communicate and, uh, and visit us lots of the vast distances to speed of water. Yeah, I mean, so that's the interesting thing. So there's something called the Fermi paradox, which is, you know, if there is intelligent life, why haven't we seen it? And one of the ideas behind this is that the galaxy, our galaxy is like 13 billion years old, and our sun is only 5 billion years old. Uh, so that means there were billions of years before the sun was even born for other planets to be born and evolve intelligent life and start even an incredibly slow process of colonizing the galaxy. You could take billions of years because you have them, but we don't see it. We don't see any evidence that there was intelligent life and it has done anything to the galaxy. As far as we can see, everything in the galaxy can be completely explained with normal natural physical laws. Um, so part of the Fermi paradox is, you know, space is big and everything's really far away, but there have been literally billions of years for things to happen. So if they could happen, they should have happened and we don't see them. So that's why it's Fermi's paradox. <laughs> Many answers are available. We don't know which one is true. Um, given the time, we don't appear to have any more questions coming online. So I think we'll... Um, one quick question, if we can make this the last one, and then we'll bring people down and have a chat more informally, I think. But we'll make this I, happen. Thank you, and that's a very good um, presentation for me, because I'm very enthusiastic in astrophysics. <laughs> When I was young, but uh, I'm currently doing the AI research, especially in computer vision. And uh, as I know, all the computer vision the AI task is to find uh, the, the common things like uh, object uh, detection or object uh, tracking with different algorithms uh, based on the, the big data. But uh, the object of Austria astronomy is to find the real things. So I don't know how the algorithms are running for, with NASA to find the the real things instead of the AI common task to find the, to do the time consuming works for human. Yeah, so, so training a machine learning algorithm to find the unknown unknowns is obviously quite difficult because typically the way we do this with machine learning is we show the code, here are a bunch of things that look like planets and here are a bunch of things that don't look like planets. And then we say, here's a whole bunch of data that no one's looked at. Tell us which ones look like planets and which ones don't look like planets. And the machine learning algorithm looks at the things that look like planets and don't look like planets and says, okay, 
this is what makes something look planet-like. And then it goes and looks at the huge amount of data that no one could possibly ever look at and says, ah, here are the things that look like planets. Um, if you're trying to ask your machine learning algorithm, find things that we don't know what they look like. And the code is like, okay. <laughs> um, so there was one paper that I've seen about, you know, looking for unknown unknowns and coming up with an approach. It was a while ago now that I read it. It's probably 2015. And I don't think I ever saw someone actually turn that into code. Um, that's actually something that citizen science is really excellent as uh, a lot of this, a lot of the weirdest planets that we found have been found by citizen scientists, because that is just people looking at the data literally one by one and being like, that's weird. And then showing a scientist and the scientist being like, oh yeah, that's weird. And then they publish it. Um, so citizen science is great for the unknown unknowns, but yes, I know, I know at least one group was thinking about it. I never saw it actually get implemented. Okay. Well, with that, I think we'll bring the formal proceedings to close. So can we thank Dr. Christensen once again for a fabulous talk? Thank you, sir. Feel free to come down and say hi and ask any other questions you have. And thank you to those who were with us online. But thank you. we'll close the presentation at this point. Goodbye. Recording will be available.